Tall Tale TV. Nuki Kubai by Stephen B. Pearl. Chapter 1 Poltergeist. My heart lurched at the sight of Kathy's robed, slender form hurtling towards the apartment's balcony and a five story drop. She was chanting frantically, trying to ground out the thing pushing her. Helping her out, at the moment, wasn't easy. I was busy keeping the furniture on the floor. Flying chairs can be hazardous to your health. We were trying to break a poltergeist link to Elizabeth, a 13-year-old disabled girl. The spirit was using her as a power source. It wouldn't have been so bad a job, except the girl's mother wouldn't let us get close to her. Religion is great, unless it becomes an excuse for hate and fear. So there we were, in the apartment above said girls, at an invitation of a friend who was tired of having her furniture attack her. Just another day in my life. Gods, I need to get another hobby. By the way, I'm Ray, wizard, lifeguard, and general poor bastard. How do you do? Splitting my attention, which resulted in a press board end table slamming into the ceiling, I put my hand in the salt dish on the altar in front of me and tossed a handful of salt at Kathy. Ground by Hoppy's power, I commanded. The energies carrying Kathy were drawn into the earth. Unfortunately, the momentum didn't dissipate so quickly. Kathy hit the sliding glass doors hard enough to crack them before she crumpled to the floor. Ow! Son of a bitch! Kathy has a way with words. Enough! My bellow shook the room. There is a power in a wizard's yell, if he knows how to use it. The furniture, which consisted of a love seat, two armchairs, end tables, and a coffee table, stopped bouncing, and the end table crashed to the floor, allowing me to refocus my thoughts. Kath, circle, now! I picked up the crook and flail, the main tools of my trade, and started walking around the altar. Kathy tried to stand, gasped in pain, and then crawled across the carpet to sit in front of the altar. Her job had been to keep the poltergeist occupied while I set up for the ritual. She'd done pretty well. I was just about ready to close the circle when Tartarus came calling. Kathy is no slouch in the zap the baddie department, but sometimes life gets interesting. By the power of the crook and flail, I do hereby set these wards that none of ill intent may enter herein. I circled the room once focusing my energies through the blue and silver banded wand with its looped end that was my crook, and the multi-tailed whip with a gold and blue banded shaft that was my flail. The couch began to tremble on the floor. The blast of energy my yell had released only dazed Mr. Spook. Shit! I could see Kathy's brows furrow in concentration as she tried to ground out our foe's energies. I moved faster, circling the room once more, repeating the charge. A stuffed animal flew at my head. I felt it hit the ward, where it stopped and fell to the floor. I circled once again. A plate from the kitchen hurtled down the apartment hall, corrected course, and came straight at me. The mystical energy stopped at the ward, but momentum carried it through. I dodged the plate, and it fell to the floor, breaking in two on the other side of my circle. I walked the ward a fourth and final time, completely closing the circle. Another plate hit it. This time, its momentum was stopped as well. One circle for each element. Fire, air, water, and earth. Earth deals with physical energy, like momentum. Got it! I took a moment to breathe. The room beyond my circle looked like a Disney movie on crack, with dancing furniture and household items. A Barbie doll flew into the air and started doing something with a pair of G.I. Joe action figures I'm sure the toy manufacturers wouldn't have approved of. That is sick! Possibly fun, but still. Kathy sat in front of the altar and watched the dolls for a moment, unconsciously toying with a lock of her shoulder-length red hair. I'm not that flexible. She turned to me. Ray, can we get on with this? Some things I just don't need to see. Kathy shifted position and grimaced. She was holding her ankle and in obvious pain. That put steel in me. Kath. Kathy is special to me. Nuff said. That damn poltergeist hurt her, and by my gods, it was going down. Right. I watched an armchair lift into the air and ram against my wards. Damn, I wouldn't mind having this guy around next time you move. Ray. Kathy rolled her eyes. I'm just saying that sofa bed of yours is heavy. Incoming! Kathy held up her hand, projecting energy out of her palm to reinforce the ward, 
as a kitchen knife flew straight at me. It stopped at the ward, hovered for a moment, then fell. It may have stopped anyway, but I wasn't going to gripe about Kathy's reinforcement. Gods! So I'm not as colorful as Kathy. Sue me. Can we get this done? Her voice was strained, and I could hear the fear in it. On it, can you help? As long as I can sit. Good. I focused on the altar where a poppet, a magic doll for the uninitiated, lay with a lock of Elizabeth's brown hair tied around its neck. Inside were some of the girl's nail clippings. Getting the hair and nail clippings had been Sue's, the apartment tenant's, part of the job, a bit of Elizabeth as a focus. How Sue got the hair and clippings, I don't know. I don't want to know. What I did know is with them the poppet could stand in place of Elizabeth. I picked it up. By the powers high and the powers low, by the elements four, in the name of Ra, the flaming sun, by Lady Isis, mistress of sorcery, I say this is not a thing of rag and stuffing I hold, but the nature and essence of Elizabeth Jane Montgomery. What is done to one is done to both. So mote it be. I passed the poppet to Kathy, who held it up before the altar. This is Elizabeth Jane Montgomery I hold, by Lady Bast, mistress of the Dance Eternal, by Lord Thoth, god of wizardry, by the elements four and the powers low and high. So mote it be. Kathy is good. I could see the poppet begin to glow in her hands. To one without the sight, it wouldn't look like anything. But to me, that bit of rag shone. And, more important, it became Elizabeth in our minds. More items slammed into our wards. I could feel the wards trembling with the impacts. Circles are strong, damn strong, but nothing human-made is indestructible. I also feared for Elizabeth. The more energy the poltergeist drew, the less she had. I was sure it was at least partially responsible for the severity of her handicap. In a worst-case scenario, a poltergeist can drain a person dry, killing them, before it moves on to another vulnerable individual. I have sworn before my gods that I won't let innocents suffer because of that kind of crap. It, it hurts too much. I laid the poppet on the altar, focused my will, and then, picking up the salt dish, poured a circle of the crystals around the doll. By the power of earth and the purified soul of man, I hereby seal Elizabeth Jane Montgomery. No force or power may intrude upon her. I break all ties around her. Ray? Kathy pointed to the circle's edge. A glowing face with long brown hair and a sweet, sad smile appeared. It was Elizabeth's face. You're hurting me! You're hurting me! wailed Elizabeth's voice. You'd have to be a rock not to be affected. But Kathy and I both knew that the face wasn't Elizabeth. It was the parasite that fed off her, enhancing the girl's suffering for its own ends. I turned back to the poppet. Picking up a consecrated knife, I scribed a circle around the doll with the blade. By the power of spirit and the will of the gods, I hereby seal Elizabeth Jane Montgomery. No force or power may intrude upon her. I break all ties around her. I felt the ward shudder and a throw cushion broke into the circle to bounce off my head. We better speed this up. Kathy knelt in front of the altar at my side. Right. I held up my hand, palm open over the poppet. Kathy laid her hand over mine, and we focused. How to describe working together? Souls join. The boundaries we normally have dissolve. Especially if you work together often. Especially if you share other intimacies. Especially if you love... If you're close. At that moment, I knew Kathy as well as I knew myself, and she me. Our energies combined, surrounding the poppet and reaching out from that to surround Elizabeth. We felt the energy ties the poltergeist put on the girl snap like overstretched elastic. The furniture crashed to the floor, and silence filled the room. I think we got it. Kathy slumped back, then hissed as the movement flexed her ankle. Almost. I stood and picked up the crook and flail. Opening my mind, I imagined a glowing white tunnel, piercing the veil between our world and the next. I thrust out with my tools and swept them in a circle, pointing to all sections of the room. By the power of the flail that commands, I order thee to return to thy proper plane and place, 
never to trouble the world of man again, so mote it be. I felt, more than saw, a wave of energy lash out from my flail, catching a pulsing ball of light. Bereft of its energy source and tied to the mortal world, the poltergeist was lost. It fought the energies I sent towards it to no avail. It didn't belong here, and the natural flows of the universe carried it through the glowing tunnel I'd called, taking it to where it did belong. That done, I sat on the floor next to Kathy. My eyes closed as my breathing steadied. My sweat-soaked white robe clung to me like a second skin. A cold, wet second skin. Magic is hard work. Anyone who says differently has never done it. After a time of wondering if I'd ever have the energy to stand up again, someone started pounding on the apartment door. Keep it down in there! I've called the police! I won't put up with this! I have a sick child at home! The shrill voice of Elizabeth's mother penetrated the wood. I ignored it. Her seeing those horrible pagans in Sue's apartment wouldn't help the situation any. The quiet returned, interrupted only by the sound of retreating footsteps beyond the door. Bitch! Kathy shifted so her side pressed into mine. She did complicate things. I shifted so my body became a backrest for Kathy. She pressed into me, comfortably. She fits. I just wish I could convince her of that. Good thing Sue's place was close enough to Elizabeth for the spell to take. Close enough to be in the poltergeist field of effect, too. Maybe that's why she got it, to guide us here. Kathy grinned at me, and I looked up. I cupped the side of her face, feeling the dampness in her hair, and kissed her. It was an old debate between Kathy and I. She thought the gods were more involved in our day-to-day -day lives than I did. I believed in coincidence. I figured Ra is pretty busy keeping the fusion rate of the sun constant so we don't freeze or fry here on Earth. That's why there are mystics. We're the oversight committee, cleaning up the messes that slip past the big guys. Yeah, my mother would be so proud. I'm a janitor. I grunted, too tired to debate. Kathy looked up at me and smiled, then, adding a tone like warm honey to her voice, said, It's over now. You okay? I could listen to her talk in that tone all day and not have a single thought I'd rate as PG or below. I smiled back at her. I'll live, but tell me again why I let you talk me into these things. You live for it. Admit it. Kathy was half right, and I damn well knew it. How's your leg? I shuffled over and examined her ankle. One thing about working as a lifeguard, you have first aid up the wazoo. Ow! What do you think? Of course it hurts. Sorry, I'll be fine. I shook my head. Are you hurt anywhere else? Ray, I'm fine. It's just a sprain. She tried to smile at me, then hissed as I shifted her ankle. Right. Kath, I think your ankle's broken, and as much as I'd enjoy doing a full body exam on you, getting you treated should come first. Now tell me if you're hurt anywhere else, so I know whether I can properly close out the ritual, or if I should just rush you to the hospital. Reaching under the altar, I pulled out the canvas toolbox that held my first aid kit. This wasn't my first time at the dance. I'd learned to come prepared. Using a cushion and triangle bandages, I splinted her ankle. I don't need... Kathy pursed her lips and looked petulant. I locked gazes with her. Gray-blue eyes stared into emerald, and for once, emerald eyes looked away first. It doesn't happen often. I normally let her win. Kathy sighed. She knew better than to argue when I was in first aid mode. I don't hurt anywhere else. You know, you were a party poop. You're going to make me go to the hospital, and I had plans. Oh, what? I finished securing the splint. Kathy smirked, and it made my heart lurch, as well as other things. All I'll tell you is it involved you, me, my see-through red lace nighty, and chocolate syrup. Oh, gods! I'm only human, and an imagination is a horrible thing to waste. Rain check? She smiled at me, and then hissed in pain as her ankle shifted. Rain check. I kissed her, and then went to work closing out the ritual. I didn't bother with the mess in Sue's living room. I'd done my job. The spook was gone. She could clean up as well as I could. I did take a moment to throw my gear into a duffel bag, 
and pull on my standard uniform of jeans and a t-shirt. A woman can wear a robe in public and pull it off as a long dress, especially when she looks like Kathy. No guy is paying attention to the robe. A guy, unless he's in Circle or the Society for Creative Anachronism, looks like an untalented transvestite, in denial. In less than ten minutes, I carried Kathy down in the elevator, with my duffel dangling off my arm. She's about as heavy as air, and I'm in pretty good shape from swimming literally hundreds of miles every year. A twenty-something woman stood blocking our exit at the elevator door when it opened on the ground floor. I noticed because she noticed us. I'm just under six foot, heavy set, muscular, with rugged features. Not model material, but I do all right. A fact that I'm glad to remind Kathy of on occasion. Despite her leg, this was one of those occasions. The girl stared at me like I was a steak. Kathy glanced at her and then tightened her grip around my neck and leaned into me. Ah, possessive displays. Kathy insists on an open relationship, or just being casual. I'm working on her. Exiting the building, I walked to my car. The crisp autumn air helped drive away the last of the fatigue the ritual had left me with. I had to set Kathy down while I fumbled out the keys to my battered Hyundai accent. I was glad it was a four-door. Once Kathy was settled sideways in the back seat, I dumped my duffel in the trunk, climbed into the driver's seat, and pulled away. My car may look like something from a wrecking yard, but under the hood, it's magic. I do my own work. Actually, I'm pretty good with a wrench. Magic has its place, but it's not auto mechanics. Not in anything you can do any way else, really. The reason mystics don't use magic to do mundane things is it takes a lot more effort than doing it the mundane way. Sure, I can start a fire with my mind, with an hour's preparation and about 20 minutes focused effort that will leave me with a blistering headache. That's assuming the tinder is dry. I use matches. We have a physical body to deal with the physical world. We have a soul to deal with the spiritual world. Where the mystic comes in is where the two worlds overlap. After an uneventful drive, aside from Kathy's obligatory teasing about my go-kart with an attitude, I had her at the hospital. I carried her in. Stephen B. Pearl is a traditionally published author whose multiple publications range from post-apocalyptic science fiction, Tinker's Plague, to fantasy, Horn of the Kraken, touching on all points between. His writings incorporate real places and focus on the logical consequences of the worlds he crafts. He can be found at the links listed in the description. His published novels include Tinker's Sea, Horn of the Kraken, War of the Worlds 2030, Worlds Apart, Nuki Kubai, Slaves of Love, Tinker's Plague, and Goodbye My Safety Blanket, along with an impressive collection of short stories published in magazines listed below. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you've got a story you'd like me to read, head on over to TallTaleTV.com for submission guidelines. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.